Having struggled to avoid relegation the previous season, perhaps a local derby with Watford was just what Luton, often slow starters, needed to kick off the 93-94 campaign. Paul Telfer opened the scoring and after Watford, with two players sent off, had been reduced to nine men, Kerry Dixon put the Hatters 2-0 in front. Paul Furlong's late effort was mere consolation. Luton 2, Watford 1. Then to Cambridge for the first round of the Coca-Cola Cup. This fine save from Jürgen Sommer led to a Cambridge corner from which old boy Steve Claridge netted a first half goal. The second division side continued to press and Sommer was again called into action to keep Cambridge at bay. Luton attacks were rare and they went in at half time a goal behind. They hit back in the second period, Jason Rees hitting the bar but they would have to overturn a 1-0 deficit at Kenilworth Road a week later. First though was a trip to Portsmouth, where after a Lee Chapman header was ruled offside, Luton continued to ride their luck. This at John Dreyer tackle was adjudged a back pass, which when Jürgen Sommer caught produced a Portsmouth free kick. Somehow Luton survived that scare, but a mistake by Kerry Dixon was to set up the opening goal for Paul Hall. Portsmouth 1, Luton 0. And so Cambridge once again, John Hartson going close. But an out of sorts town rarely threatened and it was that man Claridge again who netted to seal the tie 2-0 on aggregate for the second division side. Promotion chasing Nottingham Forest were next and fell behind to a league debut goal from John Hartson. Hartson had earlier had a goal disallowed but there was no mistaking his delight on finally finding the back of the net. Luton-born Kingsley Black, a million pound sale two seasons before, was to score an equaliser for his new side. And five minutes from time, Ian Wome gave the visitors all three points. Luton won, Forest two. Near neighbours Watford were facing Luton again, this time in the Anglo-Italian Cup. David Priest equalised a Hornets opener. But it was to be sub Alex Inglethorpe who poked home a home winner. Watford 2, Luton 1. 
and Luton's interest in the competition was ended by a 1-1 home draw with South End. Ricky Otto's free kick gave the Hatters an early scare. Kerry Dixon tried to find a way through, but it was Southend who opened the scoring. Sommer's save producing a corner, which ended up at the feet of Derek Payne. Dixon's late header, fine though it was, was of little consequence. Priest clipping the ball in and the former England striker finding the corner of the net. Back to the lead and Bolton Wanderers showed the credentials that would take them too to cut glory. John McGinley opening the scoring with a fine header. Luton did their best to grab an equaliser. Kerry Hughes going close on this occasion. And then David Priest firing wide. But it was McGinley again who was to seal the match with his second goal to give Bolton a 2-0 win. A midweek trip to Tranmere was hardly the ideal tonic and the only bright spots were an Ian Benjamin goal and the arrival of Alan Harper. Harper could do little about a 4-1 defeat but his influence would be exerted. Benjamin's goal gave town fans brief hope of some sort of fight back. But Tranmere added a fourth when John Aldridge raced clear, rounded Sommer and tucked the ball into the empty net. Tranmere four, Luton one. Middlesbrough's Ayrson Park, like Tranmere, offered little reward, but reward there was, with the first league points since the opening day of the season. Paul Wilkinson's header, well saved by an acrobatic Sommer. That effort was later credited to John Dreyer, who had the woodwork to thank from saving him from an embarrassing own goal. And indeed Kerry Hughes's chip in the second half might have snatched victory for the town. As it was, it ended Middlesbrough nil, Luton Town nil. At Birmingham, the town fell behind to Carl Schutz's header. From this corner move, John Hartson almost grabbed an equaliser. But it was Birmingham who had the better chances and really should have sewn things up early in the second half. Sommer again to the rescue. But Paul Telfer was to grab an equaliser. And Kerry Hughes missed a great opening late on, so it finished Birmingham 1, Luton 1. Struggling for goals, Luton entertained Barnsley who lost skipper Jerry Taggart after just three minutes for this foul on Julian James.
The referee waited until both players had received treatment and then showed the Northern Ireland international the red card. The ten men, though, were routed. Kerry Hughes inspiring Luton to a tremendous victory. First setting up John Hartson. Then it was Martin Williams who squared the ball to Scott Oakes for number two. Julian James decided it was time the defence had a go in attack and promptly slotted number three. And then it was Hughes again, unselfishly squaring the ball for Scott Houghton to make it four. Hartson was close to a second, but in the end settled for Oakes to net number five. Five nil winners on Saturday, it was back down to earth the following Tuesday night at home to Bristol City. Marvin Johnson conceded a penalty early in the second half, and it was calmly converted. The second goal soon after sealed all three points for the visitors. Luton nil, Bristol City two. At Derby, the Hatters were outplayed in the first half, yet only a Jürgen Sommer error allowed Paul Kitson a goal. In the second half, Tommy Johnson finally made it two. While Martin Williams' late header gave a flattering 2-1 scoreline. Paul Dickoff on loan from Arsenal had made his debut at Derby and his diving header gave the Hatters a 1-0 triumph over Notts County. And it could have been more. Hartson will feel he should have added to his increasing goal tally but in the end the town had to settle for a 1-0 win. The fixture computer then threw up another long distance midweek away trip to Sunderland. For the few who travelled it was painful stuff. Don Goodman opening the scoring. Plenty of ammunition for the Roka Roar as this free kick gave Sunderland a 2-0 lead and a comfortable victory. Once again the woodwork saved Luton from further embarrassment. Saturday though was closer to home Oxford, where Kerry Hughes and then Jürgen Sommer made sure it was a welcome three points. Table topping Leicester were a different proposition and won 2 0 at Kenilworth Road. Hartson went close early on. But when Telfer was adjudged to have handled, Leicester went 1-0 up from the penalty spot.
and then immediately after the break David Speedy wrapped things up Luton nil, Leicester 2 the match at Crystal Palace then produced one of the halves of the season five goals started after two minutes by Jeff Onger with his first touch in his first game before an expectant Selhurst Park crowd Palace hit back and equalised before Kerry Hughes solo effort restored Luton's lead but the eventual champions went 3-2 up all this before half time but there were no more goals in the second period and it finished Palace 3, Luton 2 Sunday meant live television for the visit of high-flying Charlton and it was left-back Marvin Johnson who set up Paul Telfer for a surprise winner But consistency was not a key word. Luton started badly at South End and went behind. Only for Kerry Dixon to net a spectacular equaliser. But then Jonathan Hunt consigned David Pleat's side to another away defeat. South End 2, Luton 1. Worse was to follow, or so it seemed, as Luton went 2-0 down inside 20 minutes at home to Stoke. Dave Regis opened the scoring and then this back header from an unfortunate defender was adjudged to have crossed the line but then the town staged an astonishing fight back to go 3-2 up at half time first on target Kerry Dixon then Alan Harper set up Kerry Hughes 2-2 And before a delighted crowd, there was Scott Oakes to make it three. After the break, Dixon claimed a hat-trick. Oakes's cross setting up his third for a 5-2 lead and late on up popped John Hartson to make it 6 again though the upturn didn't last as Charlton avenged their defeat of a month before with a 1-0 triumph of their own at the Valley Fans hoping that home advantage was the key were soon disappointed. Luton had chances against Tranmere.
David Priest producing a fine save from Eric Nixon. But John Aldridge needed only one bite at the cherry. Luton nil, Tranmere one. It was hardly Super Sunday when the Hatters went 2-0 down at Watford. Bruce Dyer was to bag both goals for a delighted Vicarage Road crowd. But David Priest was to start Luton's fight back after a strong run from Kerry Dixon. With five minutes to go, the Hatters won a penalty. Up stepped John Dreyer to secure a point that started a ten game unbeaten run, the prelude to Wembley and some of the best football of the season. A goalless draw at Peterborough was hardly a Christmas cracker but was nonetheless another point and confidence was slowly returning. Dixon might have snatched all three points late on. Grimsby Town continued the festive fair This effort from Dixon, Luton's best chance early on. But the Mariners went in front early in the second half. Only for Alan Harper's free kick to inspire a Luton recovery. A rare goal from the increasingly influential midfielder and well worth seeing again. Luton's victory completed with this spectacular long range effort from Kerry Hughes. New Year's Day found Luton at West Brom and found David Priest on the score sheet. Second half pressure though had to tell and the Baggies bagged an equaliser. West Brom won, Luton won. The weather then enforced a two week break before the Hatters returned to action at Notts County and fell behind to a close range effort from Tony Agana. But two late goals from Kerry Dixon gave the Hatters a 2-1 win. The winner was slightly aided by a deflection, but they all count. And so to the FA Cup. And at the second attempt, Luton entertained South End with the next round prize, a trip to Newcastle having already been drawn. Paul Telfer provided a worthy winner. Luton 1, Southend 0. 
Cup fever was beginning, but first came the visit of Derby. And that man, Telfer, again. The Rams, though, equalised from this corner. Dixon went close to putting Luton back in front. As did Kerry Hughes, but with Hughes then sent off, things looked bleak. Scott Oakes, though, was to provide one of the best goals ever seen at Kenilworth Road. Sit back and enjoy. Luton 2, Derby 1. Certainly in the autumn there were some games to remember. 5-0 home win against Barnsley, 6-2 against Stoke, but it was inconsistent otherwise. Would it be fair to say there were off-the-field distractions as well? Well, I, I think there's always going to be off-the-field distractions, but no, no, no. The, the, the reason of inconsistency is because of youth and because of um, depths of squad. Now, in, in isolated games, we had Paul Dickoff on loan at the time when we came back magnificently against Stoke. It was a very fine performance, so from 2-0 down to 6-2. Um, against Barnsley, slightly fortuitous, they had a player sent off in that game too. Indeed, we never really got playing, I think, until probably come, come December. I think there was a turning point. It was a turning point of balance and fighting spirit. Uh, but basically I began to get hold of a settled team and it took a long while. Hopefully in the coming season we will get the pattern and the shape earlier. St James's Park and 32,000 Geordies are expecting safe passage to round five of the FA Cup. Luton's Tony Thorpe was making his debut and what an entrance it proved to be. Thorpe's right foot shot gave Mike Hooper no chance. But Newcastle, inspired by Peter Beardsley, continued to press. And a disputed penalty when Harper was adjudged to have fouled the England international gave Beardsley himself the chance to equalise from the penalty spot. Sommer guessed right, but couldn't quite reach it. With cup confidence came league points, three in a 3-0 win over Oxford. Scott Oakes was again in spectacular form. Aided by on loan Mitchell Thomas, and Tony Thorpe again. Luton 3, Oxford 0. Just the preparation for the visit of Newcastle where, with Kerry Dixon injured, John Hartson stepped in. The young Welshman beat Hooper to the ball and then calmly found the empty net. Oakes was once again in devastating form and set up the opening to secure Luton's passage. Des Linton kept his head and Oakes did the rest. Luton 2 and Newcastle 0, a memorable night at Kenilworth Road.
Hooper blocked the first shot, but with everyone in the crowd expecting Linton to blast it, he calmly set up his former Leicester colleague to put Luton into round five. The unbeaten run was ended by Leicester with the Hatters, this time on the wrong end of a spectacular strike from the Foxes' Gary Coatsworth. Luton hit the post as they attempted a first half fight back but early in the second period despite a couple of suspicions of offside Ewan Roberts made it 2-0. Julian James gave the visitors a fighting chance but it finished Leicester 2, Luton 1. The next FA Cup port of call was Cardiff City and Scott Oakes provided another cup party piece. Cutting in from the left hand side, there was no stopping him. Substitute Phil Stanth though gave Cardiff hope with a second half equaliser. But Luton hit back almost immediately. David Priest allowed to continue despite Kerry Hughes being in an offside position and Priest's left foot did the rest. Cardiff 1, Luton 2. The now punishing schedule continued two days later at a snowbound Kenilworth Road where Portsmouth and the underfoot conditions were delightfully overcome. Paul Telfer started the snow spectacular. David Priest added a second. And after Jürgen Sommer had uh, somewhat fortunately survived this little incident, Kerry Hughes made it three. Scott Oakes, never won for the simple tap-in, made it four. Jim Smith's side pulled one back, but they were well beaten. Luton four, Portsmouth one. Kerry Hughes and Scott Oakes were again on target against old teammate Alec Chamberlain in the 2-1 defeat of Sunderland, which pushed David Pleat's side up to a season's best 14th. Trevor Peake and Jürgen Sommer will want to forget this mix-up, which put Sunderland back in the game late on. But Luton held on for a 2-1 win. Stuart Pearce's left foot paved the way for Nottingham Forest's opener.
and that famous left foot then hammered home the second from the penalty spot after Jürgen Sommer's foul earned him the red card. On came Andy Pedersen to face Pierce. Forest two, Luton nil. Was the fixture pileup taking its toll? Well, it looked that way against Middlesbrough. But nonetheless, a John Dreyer penalty was to salvage a point. Looking at that cup run, it started on a Tuesday night in January. Paul Telfer scoring the winner against South End. There was a real. Uh, yeah an incentive to win that game in that the winners were away to Newcastle. Yes, the draw had already been made because of a postponement. Um, Paul Telfer scored an excellent goal. Paul Telfer was another of those who had an important season for us. He played for Scotland again at B level last season. He's an emerging chap. He's now got three seasons. You see, we look at Paul Telfer now and we see he's a regular. He's still very young. Um, but. Um, there was a lot of excitement, there was a lot of tingle about the cup performances, uh, night games, um, games where we pulled back big opposition here. But that was a crucial game, Southend. Southend were playing very well at the time, but they just lost their manager and there was a changeover and there was some upheaval there. But we'd begun to settle by the time we played Southend and beat them. And then on to Newcastle and a debut goal for Tony Thorpe. Yeah, we decided to play. Hughes was suspended, I believe, and Tony Thorpe came in, and the reason he came in, because we knew that he had the capacity to snatch a goal. And um, there is real talent in, in Thorpe's boots, and if he matures and he's strong enough uh, mentally, then I think he could have a very good future in the game. His goal brought you back into Kenilworth Road and you beat Newcastle 2-0 in perhaps what was the best performance of the season? Possibly, yes, it was a good performance and of course it was uh, one of several games that the club was projected on Sky Television, which, which is always nice, particularly when you win well. And uh, we got it about right that night, we kept Cole and Beardsley quiet, or as quiet as could be. And um, we played strong and we took our chances and um, I think that Keegan was very magnanimous in, uh, in the loss and he was very supportive of us and he said he hoped we went all the way to Wembley. The cup campaign continued with a goalless quarter-final at West Ham to set up another replay at Kenilworth Road. But with good cup runs came good league form and Luton were looking relatively secure with games in hand. Struggling Birmingham looked easy prey, especially after Paul Telfer's fine individual effort. But Barry Fry's side kept battling, and Steve Claridge made another goal-scoring return to Kenilworth Road. Luton won, Birmingham won. Then perhaps the game of the season, the replay with West Ham. Martin Allen, on side, put the Londoners in front. After a neat one-two with Kerry Dixon, Scott Oakes, despite West Ham's protest, bagged an equaliser. Then, immediately after the break, from Dixon's knockdown, Oakes made it 2-1. Pushing forward to try and secure the win, 
the Hatters were caught at the back and the ball was threaded through for Ian Bishop to make it 2-2 The night, though, was to belong to Oakes. His hat-trick secured a semi-final place at Wembley. The unfortunate Steve Potts made a rare mistake. Oakes was away from Alvin Martin and Ludek Maklosko had no chance. The final whistle amid great celebrations and Oakes making a beeline for that match ball. Disappointment for Billy Bonds but delight for Luton Town and for Scott Oakes. Luton 3, West Ham 2. Clearly minds were on Wembley as the town travelled to Barnsley. Only Jürgen Sommer's heroics kept the score down to 1-0. Barnsley must have thought they were never going to score. But finally, after an hour, they did. Barnsley won, Luton nil. After his heroics at Barnsley, the giant American Sommer was at fault for the midweek opener at Millwall. But John Dreyer headed an equaliser just before half time. only for Millwall to go back in front soon after the break. Mick McCarthy's side certainly had their chances to seal all three points. Offside saving Luton on this occasion, but then the Hatters were presented with a second equaliser for John Hartson. One for Keith Stevens to forget. Priest nipped in. Hartson did the rest. The home match with Peterborough was suddenly a must to win, with the danger of being dragged into the relegation battle. Two goals for Kerry Dixon secured a 2 0 win. The second, a sweetly struck volley. And with the semi-final at Wembley just five days away, Luton fielded a weakened side at Grimsby and paid the price with a 2-0 defeat. After Livingston had gone close, Dave Gilbert, formerly with Northampton, sealed the win. And so to Wembley, the semi-final of the FA Cup against Chelsea. There was almost a dream goal for Kerry Dixon against his old club. Dimitri Karin denied him. But Gavin Peacock was first on the score sheet after 14 minutes. Confusion in the town defence, and Peacock made them pay. Luton worked hard, but seldom found the openings. Kareen rarely tested.
at the other end Sommer out quickly to thwart this Chelsea attack but it was Peacock again who effectively booked Chelsea's final place just two minutes after half time Luton had plenty of possession but couldn't create any real openings and it was Chelsea who threatened to run away with the game. Sommer again to the rescue but it stayed Chelsea 2 Luton 0. Now with the cup dream over Luton still needed to secure vital points to ensure league safety but just as winning can become a habit so too can losing. Graham Taylor's Wolves won 2-0 at Kenilworth Road. Mark Burke, who had been on loan at Luton, opened the scoring. Luton did their best to force an equaliser. David Priest denied. But it was Wolves who secured the points with a goal from Steve Bull. Luton nil, Wolves two. The first minute goal was enough to give champions elect Crystal Palace a 1-0 win. and the cup exploits were beginning to take their toll on Pleat's side. And then Bristol City were comfortable 1-0 winners at Ashton Gate. David Green's interception provided the home side with a corner Jürgen Sommer couldn't hold it and the home side were 1-0 up. Wolves then beat Luton again, 1-0 at Molyneux, although the town deserved a point from a much improved performance. Guy Whittingham scored the only goal of the game. After six straight defeats, Millwall were not ideal visitors, but after a mix-up in the visitors' defence, David Priest put Luton in front. The John Kerr's equaliser for Millwall kept town minds firmly focused on avoiding the drop. Luton won, Millwall won. The Hatters could have secured safety against South End, but managed only a point. Ricky Otto opened the scoring for South End. But John Hartson's header gave Luton a point, although South End to this day are not convinced that the ball actually crossed the line. West Brom came to Kenilworth Road for the final home match of the season, themselves in deep trouble, and the match reflected the desperation stakes. David Priest opened the scoring only for Bob Taylor to net a fine solo goal for West Brom. (laughs) 
After this clash of heads, Jürgen Sommer had to leave the field. As did opposite number Stuart Naylor after this clash with John Hartson. But straight after Naylor's departure, Luton went back in front as Julian James headed home. And John Hartson looked to have sealed it at 3-1. West Brom, though, pulled one back. And Luton were left to hold on despite nine minutes of injury time during which Mitchell Thomas and Gary Strodder were ordered off for fighting. Ironically, the teams would meet on the opening day of the new season. But with Thomas and Strodda both serving suspensions. So Luton were safe, but there was another red card for John Hartson this time at Bolton. Kerry Hughes gave Luton the lead before half time. But the 10 couldn't hold on, and the Wanderers scored twice in the last 10 minutes. Bolton 2, Luton 1. At Stoke on the final day of the season, 17-year-old Kelvin Davis made his debut in goal, but was powerless to prevent the home side taking a 2-0 half-time lead. But a minute after the break, Scott Oakes cracked in yet another spectacular effort. And after Ian Cranson handled on the line, Paul Telfer was eventually able to net a penalty as the town finished with a 2-2 draw. A mini pitch invasion took the players off the field, but they were soon back, and Telfer had kept his concentration. Stoke 2, Luton 2. If there was one moment in the season that stood out for you? so difficult. I think there was ma many good ones. Proud of our discipline at, N at Newcastle. Um, thrilled with the result here. Um, uh, very relieved the night we beat West Brom. Big night. Because it's so important that if you're working hard with, with younger players that they don't go, in, they don't go into a level which, um, which they don't deserve. Uh, but they've got to go on now. They've got to take it on. There's lots of things we can improve. Um, it's not going to be an easy summer, the summer of 94, um, because we have one or two contractual areas that, that need to be sorted out in order to keep the right balance of experience and youth. 
Um, but all in all, I'm certain that the situation is much better now than it was previously when the financial handicaps were, were absolutely strangling. They'll never be easy. They will always be fighting, I think, against the tide. I don't see that turning dramatically unless we get full houses here and we, we try and drop the salaries down even more. We, c we can't do that. We have suffered for the ten seasons or so in the, pre in the major league in the country um, because everything gets geared to that. And um, to get out of that situation means that from time to time when players' contracts expire like Alex Chamberlain's, John Dreyer's and there may be in the future others, we, we have no option but to allow them to go and say thank you very much. Um, but um, I think we've got a far greater control over everything that is happening now than, than was happening because of the circumstances.